not on. This one. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our general meeting of the Orange County School Board. Today is August 20th, 2019, and I want to welcome everyone here. Before we begin um, our meeting, we usually begin our meeting with a, a moment of silence and Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm going to ask if um, Member Gould would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance as soon as we're done with the um, moment of silence. Absolutely. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, well tonight we are recognizing several schools for their green school efforts and sustainability in initiatives throughout the entire 2018-19 school year. As we recognize the success of those schools, this year's Green Schools Recognition Program is ready to kick off for a whole new school year. The Director of Environmental Compliance and Sustainability Coordination, Jennifer Fowler, is here with us today and she's going to walk through with us the winners of, of this competition. Ms. Fowler, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm excited to be here today to recognize the top three award winners for this past school year's annual Green Schools Recognition Program. OCPS's commitment to a whole school sustainability mo model focuses on three main components, which include organizational culture, the physical place we work, teach, and learn, and the educational program. Sustainability is future focused and prepares youth to be knowledgeable, active citizens. Sustainability is also about community and recognizes the importance of aligning with the surrounding cultures. Every one of the Green School rubrics incorporates educational components. In addition to educational gains, Green Schools benefit from saving on operating costs, creating new opportunities for community involvement and partnerships, improved student and staff health and well-being, improved school grounds, learning lifelong sustainable habits, and teaching students to problem solve environmental challenges they will face in their lifetime by providing the opportunity to apply learning with the real world scenarios. From all of the applications, there were three that stood out to our community partner judges. Let me take a moment to highlight some of their efforts and achievements. At Bay Lake Elementary School, their walk to school day this past February went from an average of 250 cars to 151 cars in the car line. Based on the success of their walk to school event, the student council is taking a greater role in developing projects that increase awareness of students' role in transportation reduction, including tips for reducing cars and emissions on campus. At Millennia Gardens Elementary School, also this past February, the school loaded a bus with 22 students, five teachers, and four adult volunteers and drove the same route that the water takes from Shingle Creek down to the Everglades. While at the Everglades National Park, they went on the Shark Valley tram ride, went on night hikes, and roasted marshmallows. They also went on a sloth slog and participated in an educational courtroom where the students had to decide the best way to divide water among the competing industries we have in Florida. And at Apopka Elementary School, the school's green team recycled two liter water bottles and constructed self-watering planters. They participated in a carton to garden contest and collected over 100 milk and juice cartons which were used within the school's garden. Wood pallets were reused by painting their dolphin pledge on them. The school also participated in Beautification Day where all grade levels, staff, and volunteers played a vital role in cleaning up litter, planting flowers, and spreading mulch and watering the garden. With the campus looking its best, more teachers took their students to the outdoors for some learning in the fresh air. There are so many more stories like the ones I shared. Overall, with the support of community partners, there was a total of $23,550 handed out this past April. So it is my pleasure at this time to introduce our top three green schools. 
In third place, from Bay Lake Elementary School, we have Principal Merlene Jackson Kimball and Assistant Principal Heather Lefebvre. In second place, from Millennia Gardens Elementary School, we have Principal <laughs> Michelle Carolero, our green team, Josh Garrett, Nick Zabrowski, Dawn Shehab, and Erica Roberts. <laughs> and our first place for this past school year was Apopka Elementary School, with Principal Lukesha Miller from the past school year and our new principal, Latricia Pinder along with our green team leader, Nicole Trenton. Thank you, we are very excited to begin this next school year's uh, Green Schools Recognition Program. Absolutely, and we are so proud of you. Thank you, um, Ms. Fowler, for your incredible leadership on this program. I'm really excited. This is the first time I realized that Orange County Public Schools does this, to be honest with you, and um, the things that I've heard just in your presentation are remarkable. Can we get each of the, um, the schools to come up and just so that we can personally recognize them? And I know I, we have a very, very proud um, member, our vice chair, Member Gordon, um, cannot conceal her enthusiasm enthusiasm every time one of her schools wins anything she's a <laughs> but we're all proud of you so if you could come up we'd love just to recognize you individually All right, now I understand there's a camping trip of some sort yes. uh, out there waiting for one of us to sign up to. Yeah. For. <laughs> Member Gordon, you're recognized. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just listened to Cecilia Torres. Thank you so much for the T-shirts. They look very professional. I was nice wearing this shirt the day we got to ride on the airboats through the Florida Everglades. We thank you for your continued support of the Eco Club. And then, thank you so much again. They look so professional and so nice. They love riding on the boat. You all ought to see this artwork here on the boat. And my God, I wonder where they were here when they came up with this concept. But I do want to say, I did not get a chance. Dr. Jenkins told me that she was going to appoint Michelle Cavallaro. Michelle, will you just stand? See, you didn't stand up when the, but, but, but I wanted them to see you. Be, yo, you couldn't. <laughs> But, I, but you have an awesome team to remain standing. I didn't get to say congratulations either. I don't think I was there. I might have been in Columbus somewhere. But I, I wanted you to know how much I appreciate you because you've always carried Millennium Gardens for us with all of the things. And Josh, where's Josh? Yes, yeah, stand up. I know. I, I, can, get, I can get everybody. All of the, the, the team just stand again. Let me tell you yeah. why. This team came to us. And I mean, they never ask for anything. And I always said, no, no, we don't need it. We just need you to do so and so. But you know what? Um, Doc, uh, Mrs. McGill knows that whatever you want, you know to go ahead and put it in tomorrow. 
You put it in tomorrow, okay, because Dr. Jenkins does allow for us to do some nice things for you, and you are one of the most, the, one of the best groups that we have working in our school system, and I think these letters attest mm. to how the students love you, but you do so many remarkable things, all right? And I think not this year, but maybe next year I'll go camping with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, Michelle, thank you for your dynamic leadership and your team. Did you bring any of your other administrators? Okay, the board members are saying they want to go. How about I send them with you all this year? <laughs> and I know, I know the chair would go. Maybe Dr. Jenkins might even go. But the children, they wrote such beautiful letters, and, and we will cherish this. I'm telling you, they, Dr. Jenkins going, I don't know. Okay, but you do such wonderful things, and you make our children happy. And that's what it's all about. And I want to thank you again for your leadership there. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. Okay. Thank you. Thank and, and you, Madam Thank Jenkins. you. And just for the record, I, I did go on the camping trip, not that camping trip, but I, I went. Bill Gordon um, was the principal at the time, and I did do the camping trip. So I would feel very bad about taking anybody else's spot, okay. having already <laughs> had that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> and anybody who went with me would feel very bad if you took me on that trip probably <laughs> as well. Yeah, got a little turned around in the middle of the night trying to find the, um, the Bordeaux potties. But uh, <laughs> more information than you wanted, but you really don't want me on the trip. But I know the rest of the board is excited about that opportunity. <laughs> Member Bird. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That was interesting. Um, I just want to first of all thank uh, Ms. Fowler for everything you do for our um, sustainability and environmental things. It's fantastic. These schools are doing such great work and I know that that's um, in part due to your department, so thank you for that. And my school, Popka, I'm so proud of you. Congratulations on your first place. Um, I think that this kind of, this is what T education is all about teaching kids um, how to solve real world problems that they're going to be tasked with one day to have to solve. And uh, doing these, um, you know, these self watering planners, by the way, I need like about 20 of those for my yard because I'm real bad about watering my plants. So, um, but I think that what you guys did and the work that you're doing is brilliant, and I can't wait to see what you come up with this year. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. All right, we are going to move on. Dr. Jenkins, are there any newly appointed administrators to be recognized? There are none tonight, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Well, those of you who came to be recognized today, you're welcome to stay the rest of the evening with us, or um, if you prefer, which I suspect you probably will, um, you're welcome to leave. <laughs> and next we have our strategic plan update. Dr. Jenkins, you're recognized. Madam Chair, members of the board, it is that time of year for our unitary status update concerning human resources. Jim Prouser will get us started. Good evening, Madam Chair, board members, Superintendent Jenkins. In 2010, school board policy GCE was adopted. This evening, the HR division will provide an update on the settlement agreement and the commitment of Orange County Public Schools to employ a staff that reflects a broad diversity of backgrounds and experiences that characterize our nation. Leanne Blackmore, Director of Labor Relations, and I will provide highlights of our efforts to recruit and hire a diverse workforce. <coughs> a few items uh, to note as we go through the presentation this evening. The agreement requires a review of gender, race, and ethnic data within the district. The report is broken down by learning communities, transportation services, alternative education, exceptional education, vocational and adult education, 10 and 12 month district staff, new hires and assistant principal and principal pools. Tonight we'll show you comparisons of the previous year as well as comparisons against the baseline year. Other factors that influence hiring um, are as follows. Vacancy rates, candidate interest and candidate eligibility, which include certifications, minimum qualifications, and our extensive security and previous history screenings, which are all factors that make up the availability of our candidate pool. So now I'm going to pass it on to Leanne Blackmore, and she's going to walk you through some of the gender highlights and comparisons uh, of the baseline information. So Leanne, turn it over to you. Thank you, and good evening. 
Beginning with gender, when compared to last year, while the district-wide percentage of males decreased from 23.7% to 23.5%, we did have a couple of highlights to share. First, our male food service staff increased from 28.3% to 31%, and our male instructional staff increased from 20.2% to 20.3%. For gender comparison between this year and the baseline year of 2009-10, overall our male staff within the district increased from 22.6% to 23.5%. Our male alternative ed, exceptional ed, and CTE staff increased from 24.2% to 31.2%, and our male applicants within the assistant principal pool increased from 29.1% to 31.2%. So moving on, we're gonna to move to racial highlights. And this is specific to African American employees. So looking at the racial identification compared to last year, a couple highlights. Um, African American staff district-wide increased from 25% to 26.4%. Um, African American staff within the learning communities increased from 21.5% to 22.9%, and both the assistant principal and principal pools increased the overall percentage uh, of African American candidates. In addition, if we look at the baseline information, I'm happy to report that every category was a positive increase. Some notable areas, um, obviously um, district-wide, we had a 4.4% increase from the baseline. Transportation was an 8.8%, uh, north of an 8% increase. 31.8 to 39.9. Alt-Ed uh, was a five percentage point increase. Um, both 10 and 12 month district staff increased uh, 4% and 6.4% respectively. And new hires overall were a 6.3% increase. Okay. Now for ethnicity highlights. When we look at ethnicity compared to last year, district-wide our Hispanic Latino staff increased slightly from 25.3% to 25.8%. And our 10-month district staff showed the greatest increase from 19.9% to 21.3%. For comparison between this year and the baseline year of 2009-10, our district-wide Hispanic Latino staff increased from 22% to 25.8%. And our 12-month district staff shows the greatest increase from 20.1% to 42.1%. So as we go forward this year, our continued focus on our gender category will continue to recruit and hire males in all areas with a particular focus on learning community staff other than our high schools, transportation, our 12-month district staff, and our principal pool. Our focus with respect to um, racial identification, we will continue to recruit and hire African Americans in all areas with a focus on the East and Southeast learning community staff, 10-month district staff, 12-month administrative and classified staff, and our external applicants within the assistant principal and principal pools. Lastly, our focus on ethnicity. We will continue to recruit and hire Hispanic Latinos in all areas with a focus on the North and West learning community staff, transportation, our alternative ed, exceptional ed, and CTE group, 12-month administrative staff, and the assistant principal and principal pools. So the question is where can you find this report? The report, the report is available at ocps.net. Uh, it's located under the school board tab, and then you'll, on the right-hand side, you'll find it under uni unitary status. Um, with that being said, I turn it back over to Superintendent Jenkins. Thank you, staff, for excellent report. want to remind um, the general public 
that OCPS has been declared unitary. I always like to clarify so there's no misunderstanding. We are not under court supervision for specific ratios around our HR issues nor other issues. The board, in great wisdom, agreed to self-monitoring to make sure we did not slip backwards uh, after having achieved that unitary status. It's very important for folks to understand. We don't have ratios or numbers that we're trying to meet. We are voluntarily continuing to monitor. And the board also appointed uh, member uh, groups of citizens to our unitary status advisory oversight committee. They will receive the same report tomorrow night when they meet here at 6 p.m. Your general counsel. Woody uh, Rodriguez meets with them on a regular basis as well. Uh, that being said, we're happy to answer any questions. Hear your comments, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. And um, I have one question I know the answer to, but I think it would be beneficial for any uh, members of the public that might be viewing. And um, because one of the things I was particularly impressed with was uh, the group that OCPS invited to be part of their uh, steering committee on this uh, unitary status. If you would, if you'd have handy some of the membership because, um, as I say, I think it spoke volumes about the work that the uh, district put into making sure that this was an inclusive process. So um, just a little bit of history, particularly for our new members and members of the public. Um, back in 2010, shortly after I had started, the courts had declared that the school board was actually had met unitary status, which meant that there was no longer a need to have uh, court supervision, something that had been for 40 years in the making. Um, but before that, the school board had submitted a proposed um, monitoring uh, settlement agreement, and that settlement agreement actually got rejected by the federal court. Judge Conway said, nope, don't want to continue to monitor it. Uh, we're going to reject that agreement. So because I'm new to the position, but more importantly, listening to the leadership of Dr. Gordon, who was on the board at that time, obviously, and Dr. Blocker, the concept was we've already reached an agreement with the parties at, at interest. How can we continue this and um, make sure we honor what that agreement states? And there were three major components. One was to uh, build schools that were listed on the original sales tax list in an expedited manner to make sure that those schools in need got critical upgrades. That was part one. The second part was to look at our extracurricular activities and make sure that there was access and transparency and bless you and um, again bless you that there was transparency during the process and that those that wanted to partake whether it's in key club or sports or cheerleading or whatever they knew when it was that they could sign up it wasn't a handshake or a smile or you had to be in the in crowd or what have you so we provided that kind of transparency and then the third is uh, a monitoring not quotas or anything else but what is the reflection of our work staff look like in comparison to our students and what does it look like and so some reporting that was required those three components that were taken from the settlement agreement were indoctrinated in some policies that were adopted by the board and then to make sure that there was a monitoring component this was nothing other than the creation of dr. Gordon uh, and it was uh, we, we improved it after the first year to make sure we had quorum each board member is given the opportunity to appoint two members on that uh, on that board um, they attend approximately four to five meetings a year. They listen to the same information that you have. They spend about an hour each time um, getting caught up and asking key questions. They come from vastly different perspectives, but they come from all over the county, and um, they really do partake in this process. They take the responsibilities for the most part. I think they all take the responsibilities really seriously. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, we we enjoy having you know that conversation once a quarter and getting these updates from them. So hope that answers your question. Awesome, thank you. And, and now, Dr. Gordon. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well said, Superintendent Jenkins, and well said, General Counsel Woody Rodriguez. I think you all know I love this part um, of the monitoring process when our staff comes in and give us Mr. Presser, right? I want to make sure I'm close. Pronounced. Yes, Preusser. Okay, I'm trying to get it. I'm That's okay. I'm try close to, enough. I'm in North South Carolina here. It's okay. So, all right, it, but it, we just say Leanne. But we thank you all so much. It takes a lot of work to do what you're doing. It takes a lot of work. And um, as General Counsel Rodriguez stated, um, the improvement has been made because of his legal department. 
and having a legal department. That was one area as we traveled throughout the United States and even the world, visiting other countries and other school boards and different states. They did not have this in place. So you learn from those that err. And when we go back and we meet with those school boards, they are in worse shape than now than they were back then. And it's so sad. So I, I do want to commend Dr. Jenkins and uh, General Counsel Rodriguez and, and the staff for you all really monitoring and keeping it. I wanted to also ask, even though they meet tomorrow, I wanted to find out sometime they come to this meeting. So Mr. Rodriguez, I don't see anybody. I really don't see my representative. And I think he's going to kill me for not letting him be here because he's always sitting in here whether we invite him or not. But I think you did mention that you told them that you will be going over tomorrow. So I don't believe none of the committee members are here from the other board. And that I wish you would meet them. I think we would need to let them at least invite them so people could see because in the past this was one of the thing that we really got dibbed in real bad um, by the court and by the community. I did want to bring out the, um, the uh, with the agreement and how, I think Dr. Jenkins summed it up, so I don't want to go back on it, but I cannot express enough about the self-monitoring and, and then the HR dealing with the issues. We're not where we want to be, and I think your report is shorter than the meeting that you had with me. I think my meeting was much longer than this report, and, and, and the reason why, because I wanted to point out some of our weaknesses, but yet point out our strength. You did an excellent job in pointing out the areas that we are really, really working on, and I, I think that's wonderful, but we really have to pay close attention to the males, be regardless of what the not, what, whoever they are. We do not want to fall back, and it's no, no fault of yours, because I remember I asked Dr. Jenkins um, when she was deputy superintendent, um, and Mr. Blocker to allow our males to come in, our Hispanic males and African-American males, and somebody, they saw them on television, and they recruited every single one and took those males. And so we can't show them off like that again, Dr. Jenkins, because we lost quite a few sharp people because when people saw it, and, and Atlanta called and told me, we're coming after, and we do that. School board members, we do that. We try to go after the best, and they did take a lot of our males at that particular time. So we do want to keep that. I do want to point out um, one other area, the placement, where you talked about the racial baseline comparison the placement of where you put them is important. You just can't get rid of an administrator and then hire another person of color. This is very important for every board member to understand that and for you to monitor your district. If there is an African American or Hispanic leaving your district, you as a school board member have to work. You can't tell the superintendent who to put there, but you know if you do not replace that person, your numbers are not gonna match. And you will be coming back before the board again not meeting the standard that this board has set. So the placement of the minority and the diversity of it, it, it means an awful lot. I'm, I'm very pleased about the increase, but I'm really, you know, I'm kind of saddened about the decrease because being where we are and we have done so well, and we are in a district, and you all know my wisdom, quote, it's a poor frog that does not praise its own pond. You can't make people stay, okay? So if we hire them and they leave, it is awfully hard. So I do want to commend Dr. Jenkins, her staff, for growing our own. That's one of the best programs, and I want, uh, Ms. Leanne, if you could address that and let the people know how we are trying to uh, address the diversity concerns and issues that we have here that would help this report just go off the chart. Next time it'll be a graph up there to just show how we have gone off the chart and monitoring and keeping up with this and the general counsel is, his team is really gonna keep up. So can you just share, share that with us? 
please. We do have a number of things that we've um, incorporated over the last couple of years. One of our programs is Start With Us, where we target our high school students who may or may not be college bound. Um, but we have a job fair. We have some, some trainings around what do you do in an interview? How do you prepare a resume? So we have that program that's been quite successful for us the last two years. Um, we also have worked with our paraprofessionals who may be already have that's a degree to be teaching yeah, or really maybe close to pursuing that degree in teaching and assisting them with with partnerships with Rollins and with some of our other partners um, to get them into our teaching ranks. And then we also are doing some more work and reinstituting the Florida Future Educators um, clubs at the schools because that's a way we can grow our educators as well at the, and that's a program that actually goes elementary middle and high and so we're starting to get that back into the district um, to again try to grow our own so we want you to know even though the report is not as high as we want it to be and it's because you know people move things happen it's it's not where it used to be and i think that's what we want to look at but we want to move forward and we want to be the best in recruiting and we want everyone to know that orange county is a county of diversity and equity and we believe in that we believe in the fairness of hiring and um, placing our students. And most of our students come back and they are running our district. And I think that is one of the biggest thing that Dr. Jenkins is gonna have to really push and let people see that this is actually happening in our district. So Madam Chair, I thank you and the superintendent and her staff and the general counsel for this very fine report. You have to praise your own pawn even when you got to do even a little bit higher and better. We want the best. Thank you so very much. Awesome. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? All right. This is not an action item. We thank you very much for the presentation and for the great work that goes in, not just to putting the presentation uh, together, but Dr. Jenkins for keeping these numbers where they need to be. Mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, before we take up the, um, uh, the rest of our agenda, let me ask if there's any members of the public that wish to address the board. I do have one speaker card for uh, item 301, but if we have any other members of the public that wish to address the board? Now would be the time to let us know. No other speaker cards. Um, Ms. Dormal is scheduled to speak, and I know Ms. Dormal has been here um, many times, so I don't need to um, read the, the list of do's and don'ts because you know them like the back of your hand. So let's move on then to uh, the next agenda item, and that is 3.01. As I mentioned, Ms. Dormal wants to speak to that. I think first we'll hear a presentation from our staff, and then we'll take comments, and then we'll hear from the board members. Dr. Jenkins, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. This uh, particular policy came to Cabinet on July 22nd. On July 10th, notification was sent to CTA. On July 14th, it was published. On August 1st, there was a rural development workshop here in the boardroom, and now tonight for policy JICK regarding threats, uh, the school board has asked for final approval. I should note the purpose behind this policy is purely to meet statutory requirements that is adopted section 1006.07 of Florida statutes where we have to establish a threat assessment team and ensure accurate school environmental safety incident reporting or the CESER report. So the summary of our actions, we were required by the state to create a new policy, including their statutory language pertaining to both threat assessment teams and to CESER reporting. If uh, board members have any questions, uh, general public should understand this has already been workshopped and discussed previously. If there are any questions, we were not going to go through the entire presentation unless there were some questions from the board madam chair thank you i don't see any uh questions from board members oh i take it back member gallo um thank you madam chair um so in looking through through the policy and i'm trying to find it now i thought it was e part of the policy had mentioned uh, the policies and procedures that we must follow when we're looking at immediate health concerns for our students and I've had this conversation with, with Dr. Jenkins. I think that it would be appropriate at this time as we, as we d dive into the mental health of our students and, and as we adhere to the, the state law that we develop our own policy, school board policy around Baker Act. So I was wondering if we could get some information and um, put together some items for that. Dr. Jenkins, you recognize? Thank you, uh, Member Gallo. We are happy to have staff research and draft board policy around Baker Act, and we'll take care of that expeditiously. 
Awesome. So we will move forward um, with, with, unless there's objection from board members, we'll move forward with uh, this action today and we can come back and um, revisit this policy if that's the appropriate place. Or a separate policy altogether? Okay, I wasn't sure if it rolled into this. Um, all right, with that, without uh, any other comments from board members, let me call on Ms. Dormal. And I see you are in the capacity. I wasn't sure if you were um, representing today in the capacity of the Orange County Classroom Teachers Association, but you are, in fact. Ms. Dormal, if you can give your Thank name. You. Oh, hang on, I can do this. Wait a second, where did it go? I know they're going to lower. Oh, here we go. Yes. Hopefully. Wendy Dormal, 1020 Webster Avenue, Orlando, Florida, 32804. Okay. Now we can see you. Thank you. CTA objects to the adoption of school board policy JICK concerning threat assessment terms. FS 1006.07 requires that threat assessment teams be established and include staff with expertise in quote, counseling, instruction, school administration, and law enforcement, end quote, at each school. These team members will be required to receive training at the Office of Safe Schools to be developed behavioral threat assessment tool. Additionally, team members shall be responsible for the coordination of resources and assessment and intervention with individuals whose behavior may pose a threat to the safety of school staff or students consistent with the model policy developed by the Office of Safe Schools. The threat assessment team members, hours of work and working conditions will be impacted. Team members will be required to receive training on the state required instrument, including MTSS training and training to identify a student in crisis. Threat assessment teamwork will require additional responsibilities. A clear description of roles and responsibilities of program participants must be determined, as should the staff staffing roles of students to appropriate staff. Additionally, we would like to know the amount of categorical funding for this budget item. School safety is paramount, and any teacher assigned to a school safety committee deserves additional compensation for their crucial work keeping Orange County students safe. On June 3rd, 2019, CTA sent a demand to impact bargain letter to the district. On June 5th, 2019, CTA was told the district would provide a written response to the demand to bargain letter. To date, we haven't received a written response and have not bargained. Again, we know this is an important matter, but we just request that this item be pulled until it is bargained. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dormal. Dr. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez. So, board members, with all due respect, this is a mandate from the state that we are required to adopt a policy to address the, the creation of these threat assessment teams, which we've had in the past. We had them last year. So the board can choose not to adopt the policy, but obviously failure to do so will only mean we'll be out of compliance with state requirements. The threat assessment teams, as they are and I think Ms. Kapeski's here, maybe some others from that team. As I understand it, we try to place principals, assistant principals, and deans on there because they have expertise in teaching. So we don't always pull teachers on every one of these. I don't have the numbers or the specifics, but obviously during the period of time in which they're on the team, they're participating and they are an integral part. That was me. Okay. Yeah. They're an integral part of the requirements of assembling these teams to get a well-rounded perspective. But as an OCPS employee, we certainly have the duty and obligation to follow state law and make sure that those teams are equipped with whatever is necessary. And that, that's what's required. The language she read from is taken from the statute. That's what's in the policy. I will also point out that we are awaiting model policies that are supposed to be developed by the state. 
But because we did not have a policy in place by the start of the year, we took it upon ourselves to draft our own template policy and await what direction we get from DOE. If and when they come back with a model policy, we will then match it up with ours. But this policy, I can assure you, in every way, shape, and form, mirrors and tracks the requirements of state law. And to not adopt it, I think, would be deficient in your duties to, to adopt a policy as required. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rodriguez. Um, hold probably for follow-up questions from board members. Member Gordon. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Member Gordon. Just okay. I'll, I'll put ahead. you back on. Keep going. All right. All right. Thank you so very much, Madam Chair. Um, I just have a couple of questions for General Counsel and uh, directed to Superintendent. Um, I'm hearing you saying another unfunded mandate because I think what I'm hearing um, the President of CTA stating is that they just ask us to pull this item and until we could draft collaboratively something together we know we have to do it and we know everybody in that school is in danger and all of us are going to be working but I'm, I'm asking even though um, sometimes you have to put your foot down because the, it, it, I don't know uh, if this is another unfunded mandate and then it is unfair because now you're infringing on people's person. I couldn't even get here today. I, I couldn't get here today on time because of the change of the bus schedules. Somebody got to stay with those children. That's a mandate that those kids cannot be left alone. And it is a mandate that we have to have PLCs. So I, we had to do that. So I, I don't know. I don't see where it would hurt to pull it. And, and collaboratively, I need to know what is your time sensitive on it. It is an un, unfunded mandate. If you can't give the board dollar amounts a day, you are going to pull staff because you don't have that many administrative team. And the staff that you're going to pull are under union guidelines. So, you know, that's their personal right. They really could leave that building. And right now our, our team is leaving at 3.30 so they could get to their second job. And then that puts us in traffic and we, we really can't get to anywhere we need to go because most of us have the, the second job. So what I need to know is the only one that could be mandated would be the administrative team because once that person's time is up, we don't even have the planning that we had. I'm not going to tell you what this, the bus schedule did to us, not in Orange County, but in, in where I work, okay? It, it, it's just, it, it's unbelievable that, but we're going to make it happen. We're going to be positive and we're going to work it, but they cannot mandate our time. You are going to need planning time. I need to know, number one, are there additional funds provided by... Tallahassee that would give some type of categorical funding for those that will be managing this team. I've done this. I will be helping in my area to do whatever I can to make my school safe. There, and I don't hear anybody saying, and I haven't spoken to anybody in Orange County about this, but I don't see where it cannot be pulled until you could get together and draft something collaboratively, because this is their lives. And you can't mandate me staying when my time is up because, but most teachers we do, and we now you all are putting us out of the building. They're locking up the buildings and not in orange, I'm just saying, because everybody's on a time slot. So question number one, can this be drafted collaboratively? Question number two, is this an unfunded mandate from the state? And question number three, is it time sensitive that it cannot come back before the board and you call an emergency bargaining collaborative session? Madam Mr. Chair. Rodriguez. Madam Chair. Yes. So let me, let me speak to two items and then I'll certainly um, give over to general counsel. 
First of all, the notion of collaborating on policy is one of the reasons why, if there is input from CTA, they have an opportunity. On July 10th is when they received notification, and August 1st was your work session, rural development workshop around this policy. That would have been the prime time to gather this feedback. That's important to note. Secondly, uh, I would agree that the state has not provided funding around um, the additional time it might take for threat assessment. But I want to be careful of where we think we might um, make a stand uh, regarding the state's requirements because this policy is in response to the slaying that took place at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas where they want school systems and schools to be on top of children who may be troubled, who may have issues going on in their lives, and somebody is collectively coming together to try to support and come to some judgments around that. I would submit to you, we have this kind of process that has been going on in the past anyway. This formalizes, and the board is required to adopt a policy, but we've had uh, teams meeting at schools around troubled children in the past anyway teachers, counselors, administrators, if a child is struggling, if there's a concern, it is not unheard of. Those individuals have been getting together to talk about children that are uh, struggling. And so I don't want it to seem as though we're not concerned. The tragedy was severe. The response is to make sure professionals in a school setting are coming together to talk about troubled children and those kind of discipline issues. And again, it, there are, are no additional funds provided. That, that certainly is disappointing, but it's no surprise. The intent, though, is to make sure we don't have troubled children that we're not coming together and having professional conversations around. We've done that in the past. This formalizes it, and the board is required to adopt a policy. Last question I'll let Mr. Rodriguez speak to as to whether or not you can uh, delay it. I don't believe you're going to get any different answer, and I don't believe there'll be funding provided by the state for this. Uh, I believe uh, we will just be held uh, responsible for adopting that policy. But for the record, in, in the future, the time for such an objection is after CTA has received notice and at the rural development workshop. That's why we give it to them ahead of time. Mr. Rodriguez. So, Madam Chair, members of the board, a couple of things to just piggyback on that. First of all, it is my understanding that uh, these meetings take place during the school day. They're not typically held after hours. They're not held in the middle of the night. They're not held at 6 o'clock in the morning. They're held during regular school hours. Now, you, you may be pulling an individual from other duties, but they are going to be participating on a team meeting during the school day. Second of all, there is not a requirement that teachers who are in the bargaining unit be members of these threat assessment teams. What it says is someone with teaching experience or background. So in many instances, we have a dean, an administrative dean who would be in charge of discipline or someone else. Um, it, it can be a, a, a staffing specialist. It can be the principal. So they work to see who can be on the team that is readily available and that would have that kind of impact. I can't tell you what I could not answer and still can't tell you for sure is of all of our schools, how many of those are staffed with any kind of teachers? I cannot say that there aren't any teachers on there because I don't know the roster of all of those uh, threat assessment teams, but they meet once a month during the school day. So the idea or notion that there should be additional funding coming from the state for this is in practical, in checking with Eileen Fernandez, she just responded that they were provided categorical funding, which is where we're supposed to be pulling it from. There is no additional dollars there. And this has been in place since last year. Finally, the requirement for this is that you should have this policy in place by the start of the school year. We are now seven days in. We delayed in part because we were hoping and expecting to get template language from the state, which is what was promised in the legislation. Because there isn't template language, we have taken the leap of faith to say, we're gonna interpret the statute and come up with our own language and adopt it by the seventh day of school. But short of that, this is not a controversial policy, and I echo what the superintendent says. 
our requirement to notify the union is not a requirement in anything other than as a goodwill gesture to make sure that we are communicating. If I saw Ms. Dormal shaking her head, I'm going to confirm that our staff, my staff, someone on my, my team is supposed to be communicating that information every single time we have any policies that are going to come before the board. They are sent an email saying, here's the link. These are the policies that are coming up. So if that didn't go out, my apologies, and I will confirm that. But if it did go out, I would ask that someone on your team please review those and give us feedback before we go through the process of advertising, going to cabinet, bringing it to the board. We advertise the work sessions on top of that. Those are publicly advertised. Everyone on the planet can attend. Anyone that wants to can attend and participate. And when we don't hear comment at those sessions, we're going to assume that there isn't anything. This is the first I have heard in my team that this is a concern. So for those reasons, I would strongly urge you to support this measure tonight and then move forward with whatever we need to do in the future to correct it. Okay, um, Mr. Rodriguez, we have uh, Member Gallo, then myself, then Member Gordon. Let me just, if I can jump in before we go to Member Gallo, just to clarify two things you said that I was not clear on in case the other board members weren't before it slips away. Um, I, I heard you say, I thought I heard you say that there was categorical funding, but there's no additional funding this year. Can you just um, elaborate on that again? I may have misunderstood. I think what, I don't know if Ms. Fernandez is in the room or not. She's she in the is, back. great. I have her just come up and respond Absolutely, to that because I think you. that's the legislative component is her Absolutely. area of expertise. And then the other qu clarification was, um, it, and you mentioned um, again, Ms. Fernandez, in terms of was communication sent to CTA I'm, regarding this? Okay, yeah. if we can clarify those two issues and then we'll go to Member Gallo. Member Gallo? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, forgive me. Ms. Fernandez and then Member Gallo. Yes, the funding for this would come out of our school safety categoricals, but as we all know, there's not enough money in that categorical to cover all our safety, school safety measures that we have to comply with. Okay, thank you. And regarding <coughs> um, communication with uh, CTA? Can I, yeah, we had, two communications, one email sent on July 10th, and that was sent at 2.51 to Ron Pollard, as well as Wendy Dormal, and then again on July 17th, both regarding the same policy, uh, that July 17th email was sent at 5.05 p.m., and again, it lists the policy names, and then it usually provides a link so that you can follow that and check and see what the changes are. So that's been our process up until now. If that needs any further clarification, I'm certain, you know, Wendy and I can sit down and go through that process. Okay, let me go to Member Gallo, and then um, I, I do know that um, Ms. Dormal is requesting an opportunity to clarify a point. We don't typically do that, but it's the board's prerogative to do that under the circumstance, unless there's objection. I'm going to um, ask Ms. Dormal if she wants to take an opportunity to clarify the issue of communication. Um, Member Gallo? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair. Okay, so most of my questions have been answered, so thank you for that. And I do understand the urgency of this policy and the need for us to implement it. Um, so just, I guess, a clarification, because I know we sent, and Mrs. Dormal can respond to this or when she gets a chance, we sent communication to her on this specific policy, but she did send a letter to demand to bargain to um, to the bargaining team, which is dated June 3rd. So, what, so I guess I'm confused as what... She did initiate her desire for this to be discussed in June. I know that we sent her the policy, but what does one trump the other? And am I allowed to ask, was this bargained initially? Like, was it discussed in bargaining? Because it was requested, like, just, and I don't want to, I don't want to get in trouble here. I'm just tr trying to understand. And maybe I'm off track. And Member Gallo actually had that same question. So if it's not inappropriate, um, Mr. Rodriguez, we'd like to know, I think, from um, Mr. Preusser is, after this was sent, was there a response to this that indicated that we're not bargaining it? Or was there some miscommunication about whether this was adequate to be on notice and not have to show up at the meeting? Mr. Preusser? And actually, Mr. Poyser knows this so well himself, he'll know if he can't answer that question. You understand what we're talking about. If you have this letter, we don't see a response from you saying we're not going to be bargaining. So in, if she I, didn't see that response, then maybe they didn't show up because they felt they were on notice. I understand. Um, it was discussed in person. It was also discussed on June 11th. Okay. Verbally and okay. at the table. All right. Thank you. And Ms. Dormal? 
You want to take an opportunity to yes, clarify from your perspective? I would. Um, we sent actually four demand to bargain letters. This was among them. And then we received a response um, to confirm receipt of our letters from June 3rd, saying that they would review and provide a written response in the next 14 days, which we did not receive. We asked for it to be put on the agenda, um, and it was told to us that you were waiting, or the district was waiting for policy from Florida DOE or from more information. On some of our demand to bargain letters, such as um, Best and Brightest, I did provide the district with information received from um, FEA through um, our people there and asked to have that we put on the agenda. All of these demand to bargain letters, I thought, were going to be taken to the table. I did receive, I do receive routine notices. Some of them do have links, some of them don't. Some have initials, uh, initials like JICK, policy JICK, which I don't know what it stands for, truthfully. But um, I do come to every school board meeting and saw a PowerPoint, but I still expect it to be able to bargain this. The concern we have is not just what I stated in here in the letter, but also because last year there were teams and there were serious concerns. There are some people in our bargaining unit, like mental health counselors, behavioral um, health, um, specialists and even social worker who have licenses and they're concerned about if they have to be on a team or give counseling to someone could they lose their license because there's regulations that's one of the things we want a clarification on um, there's also the question of liability insurance um, these teams are charged with making very serious decisions, and when I know you talked before about Baker acting. Um, there's consequences for people who make decisions and don't have insurance, and they've expressed that concern. So we wanted to be able to bring those groups of people who have these concerns to the table to be able to express those concerns at the table and see if we could have language to address them. And also, um, they're concerned about the time and will it take time away from other duties, other duties that they have during the day? You know, how will they be spread, spread thin? Um, deans are part, I know people consider them administrators, but they are um, members of our bargaining unit, deans are. They're just like teachers. So they need to be represented and to be respected too, and their time needs to be respected. And also um, counselors are too, and they've expressed some concerns. So maybe we just need to meet to make clarification because we all agree that we need um, safe schools for our children, all of us here. We just want to be able to bargain for our members, and we did ask to bargain. Um, we we did send the letter to bargain, and so we expect to be able to do that for them. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, Madam uh, Chair. Member Gallo did Madam that. Madam Chair. Yes. I'm sorry, just okay. one clarification. So I could have Mr. Prowser stand up again and refute some of the things. I don't want the back and forth that belongs at the bargaining table. The bottom line is threat assessment teams have already been meeting. The board is required was required for the start of the school year to adopt a policy which simply confirms what we are already doing. For the safety of our children, teams get together to discuss what they believe might be a troubled child and what the strategies might need to be around them. The back and forth between who said what, Mr. Prowser's ready to dispute it. This is not the arena for back and forth between the CTA president and your chief negotiator, but he does not agree with some of her rendition. Bottom line is, you're required to adopt a policy. Our threat assessment teams were meeting all of last year. The intention is that no troubled child go unnoticed at the risk not only of that child, but of the rest of the population in the school as well. 
And so you're adopting a policy that affirms what we've already been doing. Additional discussions at the bargaining table are certainly not inappropriate. This policy that was shared ahead of time was not debated at your rule development workshop. I would, I would hate for you to remain out of compliance with what is required by Tallahassee, but I can't tell you what their next moves might be since they didn't provide additional direction. You were supposed to have something for the start of the school year. Um, the, the, the bargaining issues around it do not change the statutory requirements of the school board. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity. You're, um, you're back in the queue. I'm going to take this opportunity as I'm queued up to speak um, just to share my thoughts at this point. So uh, one, this, is, this has happened several times now where we have different versions of what has happened at the bargaining table. I don't think this has been a common occurrence in previous years. Um, I'm going to offer a suggestion. It may be the superintendent's uh, decision. It may be the board's decision, but just a suggestion um, for consideration moving forward that it might be valuable to record the bargaining um, sessions because uh, at one of our recent meetings, that, uh, I heard a uh, conversation at the podium about threatening language, and um, I know the board was concerned about that. The uh, what I have heard back is that's not what happened, and I think that this is not particularly productive. The he said, she said, and this is too important of an issue for us, for for everyone to not know what's happening. So I think there's a high degree of accountability that will take place if those um, meetings are recorded. Um, secondly, I had a number of questions. Most of them have been answered. I appreciate completely and understand the concerns of teachers and counselors and everyone else who um, may need to be part of this threat assessment team and has concerns either about their time or about their liability. I completely understand that. Having said that, I also understand that at the end of the day, while, while th a lot of the public believes that this board has final say, in reality, the legislature has final say. We are an agency, a body of the legislature. We have um, a certain amount of control, but when it comes to legislation that's been passed, we lose our control. And if it had been the intent of the legislature to make sure that teachers were paid or high liability um, had been, insurance had been um, procured, or some other provisions that would have taken place. That was not, it is a mandate, we missed the deadline. Um, I understand why we missed the deadline, I think it was completely excusable that we waited an additional week because we were gonna have more guidance from the legislature. I do not think that the public or the legislature will um, understand or think very well of this board that we do not pass a mandate to have threat assessment teams in our schools when, as Dr. Jenkins has pointed out, this came about because of the lives of innocent children and the lack of abilities of schools in the past to have an effective way to identify students who need help and could be a serious threat to themselves and others. This is a very serious issue. I wish the legislature had dealt with it differently, but if in going forward, and I know this will be controversial, and but going forward, if we decide that we are going to bargain every issue that we are mandated to enforce, I think that we'll be, we will put ourselves in a very difficult situation because at the end of the day, if you can't walk away from the table there is no such thing as bargaining and we can't walk away from this table without a, a, a forgive me didn't get enough sleep last night uh, abiding by state law so we absolutely have to walk away from this table in compliance so my vote today as much as I regret that we do not have um, a situation that that teachers and counselors and deans are comfortable with is going to have to be to comport with the law and pass this ordinance or this um, policy today uh, with the idea that we should be coming back and having discussions about what is proper compensation for uh, anyone who is working overtime to meet these requirements. That's, that's my position, um, and unless I hear something that is compellingly diff different than I've already heard, I, I just don't see where I have any option given um, the responsibilities that are placed on us. Given that, let me recognize uh, our Vice Chair Gordon, and then we'll go back to Member Gallo. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, I'm hearing and I'm listening to everyone. Um, I've been on bargaining teams. I've, I've been under, I think everybody at this table, whether you were a parent or an educator or a business person, we all have been under the state mandate. Right now, the charter schools are under mandate 
and other school districts are under mandate to make sure that the police officer, those are the ones that's the most important to me. I don't know if they're gonna be able to meet their deadlines. Um, I'm, I'm hearing it differently because, uh, maybe because I've sat on a bargaining team before. Um, I'm understanding what you're saying, that uh, the time to object this was then. And, and, it, and apparently it didn't happen. And, and, and like you say, you don't want to go through, I, I, you know what, I feel, I don't know, I feel something because I, I brought up when I did get the email, I think I was on my way going to Columbus, Ohio, and, um, and I think I sent it to Dr. Jenkins, and then I think Dr. Jenkins sent it um, to Mr. Purse. I'm going to get that right sooner or later. <laughs> A little, another session, about an hour, I can have it mastered. Um, and, and then it all got the ball rolling, and then all of a sudden I said, oh my God, did I wake this thing up, or what did I do? I do know that we have had, in the past, emergency meetings. And if it means that much, you do have a, 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 a group of teachers out there that are saying something, I, this must mean something um, for, for them to come and all of the things listed to just say that they just wanted to collaborate on it and talk about it. Um, I saw a list and I went through and I read all that stuff that we got to read in the orientation package and fill out all those forms and go through all the counseling because what they are asking us to do, I don't know how many people are familiar with the Cognito um, form of counseling, that's every teacher that have to go through that. I don't know, Dr. Jenkins, if you're doing it, but I do remember the, um, I don't know what we're calling it where I am, but the assessment team didn't include me per se, but I know that I have a duty to do that had been assigned to me from my principal, but it's a safety procedure that's just common sense, as you stated earlier. But then when I saw the list, it was people like, well, the dean was one, which is a teacher, but then um, the social workers, depending on what county you were in, then I looked at other counties to see who they had on that, who they were going to assess. And I think it's county by county also that you gotta have it, but you have to, I guess each superintendent will let the principals know who they're going to have. I think, I know in my county, it wasn't no burden on us because it was more like the social worker, that's what they do. And we even went to the rooms, we took a, the first week of school and introduced ourselves as to what we do and how we can help those students. And then it was a social worker, there was a psychologist, then there were some other key people that was not directly responsible with classroom, uh, you, know, you know, with the teaching in the classroom. I still don't feel comfortable that my question was answered when I ask about is it, you said it was time sensitive, but you didn't say it was time sensitive, um, General Counsel. You said we are seven days in. So I'm wondering how much leadway those people that haven't gotten this far, because all of them haven't turned it in, and then those that do not have police officers in their school, which is to me the most serious of all, especially if they don't have weapons, if they're not carrying weapons. Um, that's to me the most serious. I, I don't, I'm asking, we have pulled things from this board before if it was needed to keep peace, to keep love and harmony, to act like we're listening. If we're not, I hope we are, you know, because the, it, a message was sent some kind of way. And I, I don't see where this is such a big deal. I'm being honest with you. As long as you get it in there. You got most, you got the policy, it's just one piece, but if, if I'm wrong on it, then Miss Wendy needs to come back to the table and express to me if this is the only piece, or are they gonna get in there and then all of these other things come up? Is it going to be that? But I do know we are allowed to have emergency meetings with our bargaining. I've served on the bargaining team in Orange for years, and I've served on the bargaining team in Osceola County for years. 
So I don't see where it's a big deal. If we have a deadline, we approve it today, and, and Mr. Rodriguez, you always say, well, it got to be announced in the paper. It has to be this and that. I didn't hear any of that. So if, there, if you cannot call an emergency meeting, and I did not hear you say that you can, because I know that you can. I know that you can do that. I know you can do that. So if you do call it, or uh, consider calling it, what is your time sensitive limit that I asked at the very beginning that did not get answered? Mr. Rodriguez. Dr. Gordon, uh, members of the board, the deadline is the start of the school year. I know you said and we're seven days in, so we're already late. And don't keep talking because anything you say can be used against you at this board table. You already said we are seven days late. And you're really more than seven days late because we should have had the policy before school started. So we're a little bit more than seven days late. I'm in my second right, week. Member Gordon. So I, I need, I'm going to let him finish, Madam That's Chair, but I got to get my answer that I did not get. So with grand juries out there, that are holding school districts accountable for the lack of adoption of policies. I cannot advise this board other than to say, thou shalt adopt this policy tonight, and we can always go back and work on the other perspectives about what is proper compensation, if any, that should be bargained. But at this point, the policy is what is, is preeminent here because it's a mandate of the state. And I can only tell you from the correspondence we have seen from the Department of Education, they have made it perfectly clear. You fail to adopt policies, you will be subject to potential indictments and grand jury investigations. Whether they're founded or unfounded is irrelevant. I'm just putting it out there for the board. Y'all make your decision. You're the elected officials. You have the tough job of making these decisions. I'm just giving you the options. And if you fail to adopt I anything tonight, me. the reality is then you will eventually have to adopt something, but you could be subject to further scrutiny from the state. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, General Counsel. Madam Chair, is it, I need to ask Ms. Dormal a Ms. question. Ms. Dormal, can you respond to Dr. Gordon's question just a moment, please? Can Thank you. you ask it again? Okay, I heard the General Counsel say that he keeps throwing in the compensation. My question that I ask him, I asked three questions. I showed him we were under, the superintendent assured us there are no funds. We, it is an unfunded mandate. So knowing that you know that it is an unfunded mandate, what is it that if there is something that would help this board to get you guys together as two bargaining teams, what is it that you need to discuss? that would help you since you've heard everything tonight? Because it, w the question was, you came up and you talked about funding. Now, mm -hmm. I found out for letting you know, just talking, and we don't talk. You know, you and I don't talk. Okay, you know that. Okay. It is an unfunded mandate, so there are no funds. So what do you, what are you looking for are us to, to do? Are you told, were you told it was an unfunded mandate? We just, we just they just, uh, the, uh, the attorney came up from the general counsel department and said that there were no funds. Because that was one of our questions. Yes. Um, so we asked to know, we, we understood that this was a categorical um, mandate from the state. So um, if it was, it seems there would be funds, you know, to us. So tonight I'm learning there are no funds. Is that true? Let me, let me go back to Dr. Jenkins because I think, uh, I think it's extremely important that we're precise in our language. Um, so Dr. Jenkins, you want to explain the categorical funding and the status? So as uh, attorney Eileen Fernandez just clarified, if there were dollars to support this, it would be in your safe schools allocation. That is the same allocation that does not have enough money for us to get to buy all of our SROs. This board supplemented those dollars for SROs. And so while they are categorical dollars, they don't stretch far enough and 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 my fear is we may be overthinking this since threat assessment teams have worked all of last year if you would think for a moment miss dormal iep teams meet for similar reasons someone from counseling someone with instructional background 
school administration, and law enforcement. Once a month, they started last year, they come together to discuss any child they believe is trouble. So I want you to picture an IEP meeting, only in this instance, a law enforcement officer is included and they are discussing specifically a child who seems trouble that may be a threat to themselves or to the school to prevent tragedy. So I, I, when I say overthinking it, this notion that there are loads of people meeting every month, it only requires somebody with counseling background, instructional expertise, school administration, and law enforcement to prevent tragedies. Thank it's, you. That's simply what they're trying okay. to get at. So right. it, this is not a dialogue and a question. I mean, you had a question. And I think we got an answer. Um, Member Gala. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I just want to be, I want to be clear, and I think that we are. So the counseling, some of the issues that were brought up were the, were the liability insurance and, and other issues, and I think Dr. Jenkins says that those can still be discussed if we vote this policy down today. Is that correct? The, if we vote it up, I'm sorry, if we vote it up. Um, and then the language concerning the counselors, we're bound by statute to include counselors in the threat assessment. So that's not even a choice that we have because we have to comply with the law. Um, so I thank you, Mrs. Dormal, for, I mean, thank you for sharing your concerns with us. I, I, I will be voting up on, on this policy tonight because what I've heard here is that we will address some of the issues that you brought up. Um, with the district so that we can have those conversations because we do need to have those conversations. We don't want our teachers being worried about their licenses or being worried about, about you know, bar liability insurance. So we need to have those conversations, but I've been told that we can still have those conversations. So with that in mind, I will be, I will be voting up on, on this policy this evening. Thank you, Member Gallo. Let me, let me just clarify or let me point out one other issue um, that I think it should be more clear to all of us, and that is that, Mr. Poiser, you reached an agreement with the CTA bargaining team, and they sent out a proposal to the membership. And that proposal did not include any requirements regarding this issue. Is that correct? That is correct. So if this had I, been... If I may add, can I yes, add Yes, please. So... Um, basically there's minutes that identify what was discussed at the table and so the, the items that you're referring to the four items in the letter I guess you passed out a letter to you I don't yeah. know um, that was all held in advance by the union at their request so do the minutes get approved at the next meeting in the next bargaining meeting the minutes the minutes were approved the 611 minutes are approved and they're available on the website okay, okay. so I, what yes. occurred to me as I was listening to this conversation um, is that this issue is being raised today. If this war had been still an outstanding issue because of the email that we're seeing and the lack of the district's willingness to bargain this issue, if that had been the circumstances, then we would, st we would not have been in a position where the union would have sent out this proposal for a vote. So... It, it was sent out, as far as we all knew, this was not an issue, and it's now an issue. I'm just, I'm struggling a little bit with the timing of that. Um, but I, regardless, I understand the concerns that teachers have, counselors have, the concerns about whether this is going to be additional time, whether it's gonna be overtime. The superintendent has indicated that this is time during the school day. Um, yeah, I think if we learn something different, then that's something that the, the board may well wanna take into consideration and give some guidance um, in the next bargaining session. But I still believe that anything other than approving this at this point in time would um, both be in violation of the statute, but I think even more important, would um, send the wrong message to our parents, our students, and our, and our faculty about how much we value the safety and security of our children. So for that reason, I will still be voting in the affirmative. Member Kester Dental. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, my concern is um, same as yours and Member Gallo, in that um, I understand the confusion. I'm confused. Um, about um, 
the discussion of, of details that are not necessarily ironed out. I'd like to know more. However, um, given that we have to adopt this policy and we have already um, started school, we must adopt the policy. Um, if it wasn't this, this topic of um, a threat assessment team, um, if it was something more, um, or actually less serious and less urgent, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't mind pulling this. However, this topic, uh, along with the weight of the legislative mandate um, and combined with the environment in Tallahassee and around the state right now, um, I don't think it would be wise to vote this down. Um, so I'm going to support adopting the policy tonight. Thank you, and I agree wholeheartedly with your um, observation that if this were not something that was mandated, um, if we weren't in the climate we're in, and if this wasn't an issue that was so serious in terms of life safety, um, I would be inclined as well to postpone this and let's revisit it. But unfortunately, that's not where we stand, and I see the board nodding. I think that's the basis on which if it moves forward, it'll move forward. Is there a motion to approve or not approve this policy? Motion by um, member Gallo to approve. Is there a second? Second by member Lopez to approve. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Let the record reflect, and I'd like to speak to why I'm again. Please. My reason for speaking to why I'm against it is because, as I stated earlier, the time sensitive means a lot to me. Um, we can always, as a board, our next meeting is in September we can get consensus in a work session. We've done it before. We don't have to do the whole policy. We could pull that item in which I checked with general counsel to say, we, uh, we've done it in the past, and I need him, he could share, uh, if he needs to, but I'm letting you know, I'm, I'm, I know you just did that, but I'm really asking you to take a look at it. We're trying to keep something together here, and I don't know if you truly understand it. I know you're thinking, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, but I've seen board members totally vote against things at this board table within the years I've been here that were just flipping, just totally flipping. But I, I'm, I'm trying to get something here that I know can be done because we have worked it before. I would like to ask my colleague to resend her motion and the person that seconded to do it and turn it in the form of letting us have a work session for just that item, just that item. And then within that work session, we could come up with consensus and then that policy more than likely could be passed or voted up or voted down whichever way and we could be back to where we are. So Madam Superintendent, Madam Chair, and General Counsel, back to you all. Is there, there's uh, no interest by the motion or the seconder to resend the motion. Um, we have a statement in the record for the reason for an objection. Do, uh, would anyone like to put a statement in the record regarding the reason for approval? Um, I actually think that um, Member Kester Dennell's statement was um, an excellent statement. If the, if the board is all right, we can include that statement as to the board's reason for going forward. Member Castor Dental, I'm not saying it has to be assigned to you, but I think that you um, articulated it extremely well. Board is all right with that, Member Castor Dental? Are you okay with us including that statement? Again, it doesn't have to be your name. It can just be a statement as to the board's reasoning. It has to be a name. It has to be a name. It has to be a name. The motion you fine with that? Has to be carried by. The motion is in a name. Okay. Well, you said it doesn't have to be, but it does have to be. The statement doesn't have to come from the motion. It can come from anyone. But um, with that, we need to move on. Okay. Okay. Let's, uh, Dr. Jenkins, no changes to the uh, consent agenda? No changes to okay. the agenda, Madam Chair. All right, uh, the board, uh, we don't need to amend the consent agenda. Are there any members of the public? I only have one speaker card. I assume there are no members of the public that wish to amend the, that wish to speak to the consent agenda with that. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So motion by member second. Gordon, seconded by member, um, oh my gosh, it's really, I'm sorry. <laughs> God. 
I have a little bit of jet lag. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> okay. All in favor of the motion? Shouldn't please say aye. Aye. Opposed. Uh, Ms. McGill, I hope you're keeping better track than I am, my dear. Okay. Moving on to the non-consent agenda, there is nothing on the non-consent agenda. Informational items, Dr. Jenkins, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this uh, is an opportunity I'd like to take advantage of to show you the two latest videos added to our code of conduct. There are two issues that we're extremely concerned about for our young people and for their safety. One has to do with vaping and the other has to do with foolish threats. Uh, which again, um, uh, we want our young people to understand there are consequences behind it. So if they're listening in the back, roll those two new videos that were developed by our students and uh, with the help of our video services team and have been included for our students to watch during this first week of school. Roll it. school tomorrow have guns and I must shoot this place up oh my god hey, it was a joke dude joke it's not a joke I didn't mean anything by it In case you weren't clear on the first video, so it escalated from a level three for vaping because minors should not be in possession of nicotine. It, it's inappropriate uh, contraband to bring on campus. The second portion, the police officer was testing it for drug content. So if there's marijuana that you're vaping, then it es escalates to a level four. I want to commend again um, uh, some members from my superintendent's advisory council for helping compose these. Those are students of ours doing the acting. Um, and some of the administrators are on the PR team. They're not actually administrators. But some of our own police officers were in the video as well. Again, we believe um, peer-to-peer conveying of some of these 
issues is much more effective than just adults standing and reading the code of conduct for the first week of school. And so all of our students who have their laptops, it is loaded on their laptops. They are required to watch those videos as part of their orientation for the beginning of school. And then it's also available to parents. Encourage them certainly to watch and share with their students at home as well. Vaping and foolish threats are additional concerns we have this year, and we will be on top of them strictly. Member Gordon. Yes, Madam Chair, I wanted to say thank you. I mean, this is really rich and high class. I mean, it's just wonderful. Um, our team and, and all your AV departments are just doing an extraordinary job with that. I'm glad to hear you say that um, it, it, we're not playing. But when you listen to the news, and the students get arrested, not our students, but when you see national news and they're arresting, most of the students are nearby county, they're saying it was a joke. Everything is a joke. So some kind of way with our parents, and you, 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 I hate blaming parents for students' behavior once they get in high school or middle school, you know, you take a little blame with elementary, but middle and high, you kind of feel that they have some kind of sense of responsibility or they're getting there. But I know when I came on board, it was zero tolerance. And still yet, some kind of way we need to get that message to them and we have to go back and I know we already did the code of student conduct and we were able to change the wordings and stuff but some kind of way we need to let them know at, with certain things like you those two that you're talking about the bringing the guns faking the guns like one lady took the roll of toilet paper uh, towels and p put them all together and then wrapped them with an extension cord and then to actually told the policeman she had a gun in the house, but she did point that at the neighbor. Well, they took her own off, you know, and we know she's mentally, you know, you got some kind of mental illness without making any judgment. But some kind of way, everybody, you know, it, they knew we had zero tolerance, but we need to really let the kids know it's, it's, it, if you cannot say you did certain things that are level fours and say it's a joke. Because that's, that's what's happening around the nation. And so I want to, you know, I really want us to make sure that the message get out to our students. You know, gun threats, writing on the mirror, calling on the phone, sending text messages, that's zero tolerance. We, we just don't want to tolerate that kind of behavior because it, it, it will eventually lead to someone getting hurt. So I really want to commend you for pushing that. And we're getting the words to the parents to let the parents know, don't feel bad when you, we come and arrest your child. And then you say, oh, he was just kidding. We have to get the message to the parents too to let them know it, it's not a joke. It's not a joke when you violate a level four. Thank you so very much. Member Lopez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I like the videos. The fact that we are having a visual understanding of the code of conduct is very assertive. And it's not only that we have the video and that's it, it's also that we have discussions in the classroom and questions about the, you know, that behavior. So it's very, for me, it's very important to have that because, you know, sometimes we have students having that, those type of problems, but we also have it, in, you know, have it um, written in the code of conduct. But now we have the video, it's more visual, it's gonna be more effective. And we have the discussion, it's something that we can keep the conversation in our home with our children. So I congratulate the, the team that developed the video as well. Thank you, Member uh, Gould. I started posting these on to my Facebook page too, and I think it is a tool for parents. And while they're unsettling to watch, some of them especially the, the when you see handcuffs going on kids or the, the threat in the bathroom, um, it is a conversation starter for the parents, and so I encourage them to watch them because I think 
it really helps that kitchen table conversation um, and to drive it home so that they can support that there are consequences when you make bad choices. And we know as we're growing up, we don't always make the best choices. It is the time to learn, but some things are just more severe than others. All right, thank you. Um, anything else, Dr. Jenkins? Thank you, and if you haven't already, you may have, um, if you haven't already, if you would uh, email those out to board members, because um, I think the idea of posting it on your Facebook account was an excellent idea, Member Gould. Um, next, we have uh, Dr. Rod or, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, Council Rodriguez. Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, just a, a executive session notice. Uh, this is for after the meeting of December or September 10th, 2019. The School Board of Orange County, Florida will meet in an executive session on Tuesday, September 10, 2019. Immediately following that school board meeting, scheduled to start at 5.30 in the superintendent's conference room, ninth floor, um, at the Ronald Blocker Educational Leadership Center located here at 445 West Amelia Street in a matter to discuss uh, initials DB and uh, POB versus the Orange County School Board. The following persons may be in attendance. All school board members, Dr. Barbara Jenkins as superintendent, myself as general counsel, Aline Fernandez as associate general counsel, Ralph Martinez, Esquire, and Philip F. Mooring, Esquire, as well as a court reporter. Um, board members, there have no other report at this time, um, but thank you. All right, thank you. Um, we have no member uh, uh, committee reports. No, we do, actually. A brief report from um, Member Gallo. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I just wanted um, to update the public that we are having another legislative committee meeting. You all should, as school members, got noticed for it. This meeting will be short. It's just to add more teeth to our career technical education um, priority, so it will give the ability for um, our legislative team to more effectively advocate in Tallahassee. And on along that note, I know we've gotten um, some inquiries about going up to Tallahassee from our teachers and from from the community as a whole. So I really want to revisit that webinar that we had discussed previously, and I'm hoping that we can get together maybe with the communications team and get started on that so that we could have something maybe up and running um, for our community and our teachers and our parents prior to October, if that's possible. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any, um, any other policy issues to come before the board other than policy issue that uh, member uh, Gallo raised earlier having to do with Baker acting? Any other issues? If not, this meeting is now adjourned.